Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Thank you to our generous underwriters of Sharper Iron, the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. And Luther Classical College, a college for Lutherans by Lutherans, opening in fall 2025. Learn more at lutherclassical.org. On this Friday, October 13th, we're studying Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11 through chapter 6, verse 3. In today's text, the author of Hebrews calls the congregation to approach the Word of God not with childish immaturity, but with childlike faith that seeks to dive even more deeply into the doctrine that God teaches. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Jacob Dandy. Pastor Dandy serves at Zion Lutheran Church and School in Terrabella, California. Pastor Dandy, welcome back to Sharp Iron. Hey, it's it's a pleasure to be on with you again, Tim. So we get started today. Pastor, give us some context. Where have we been in this epistle? What should we know leading up to this section of text for today? Yeah, yeah. So the, the section immediately preceding this, um, the author of Hebrews, um, he he introduces this this concept of Jesus being the the great high priest, um, uh, the one who stands between sinners and God uh, to intercede on our behalf, right? Um, and he uh, says that he's high priest, not uh, according to the, the line of Aaron, uh, but according to the order of Melchizedek, right? Um, and so, you know, he's, he's kind of introducing or going to be discussing this, this theological idea of the um, ultimate high priesthood um and that is the one that is jesus um it is the 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 son of god who is both priest and sacrifice and he's going to talk about how this high priesthood predates moses this high priesthood um um predates you know aaron being established and all of his descendants being established as the uh um uh designated people who would be priest over the people of israel um, and he says, no, he is the high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, right? He's the high priest um, according to the one who blessed Abraham before there was an Israel, before there was a Sinai, uh, before there was Torah or law given to Moses um, at, that, that predates Israel as a nation where it really is reduced to the forefather, uh, the patriarch of Abraham, right? Um, and so as he's introducing this topic, uh, our little section of text today um, is going to be um, the author of Hebrews really saying, hey, this topic is going to need a lot of explanation and unpacking, and you guys need to listen. And you guys actually should probably know this already, your Hebrews, your Jews, you have been instructed in this before, this should be an easy connection. So I'm telling you now, you need to listen. You need to listen to what I'm saying because this is going to make things very clear to you and this is going to be a doctrine that blesses you. Uh, and so that's kind of where our text is going to be is that they need to be told how to listen to the teaching that the author of Hebrews is about to give um, uh, and, and in part because they've maybe been negligent hearers right um and so uh there's going to be lots of unpacking lots of discussion lots of teaching that's about to happen and so what he wants the hebrews to do is ensure that they're listening um and building on what he's about to say so if if we think about the letter to the hebrews as a more of a sermon to the hebrews is this almost a, an interlude a, a moment where the pastor pauses and said hey you need to pay attention to what's coming next it's going to be a little bit difficult so get ready buckle up a little bit like that yeah yeah exactly like that um that's exactly it right um uh what we're what we have here it's it's not you know it's kind of uh the author in between it, right in the middle of making a point in the sermon saying you need to listen now 
this is a big deal. Um, and, and you got to hear what I have to say. Right. And so sure, tune sure. in, this is, a, this is good for you. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And, you know, yeah. I mean, thinking of, that's as about a, it. a preacher, when you think as a preacher, sometimes that's a, that's a helpful thing to take a, a bit of a pause. It, you've been unpacking some doctrine for a while and to just take a moment and say, okay, I know we've, we've been here and we're about to go here. So here's a little bit of a break and not a break in doctrine per se, but just a moment to, to reorient ourselves, to make sure that we're listening to God's word for all the teaching that he has for us there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and really this is, this is the doctrine of Christ too. Like, um, really with, with the, the authors here really wants the people to receive is that, you know, um, this is the doctrine of the, the Messiah that you have been in long expectation of. And so, um, this is worthy of your attention. Right. And, and that maybe that's the, the, the big thing. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, pastors can be preaching a sermon or, or kind of making a point, uh, and the people are just going to kind of process through it or their mind is somewhere else or, or they're, they're dealing with pastors last tangent or whatever, right. In the sermon, um, uh, mentally, uh, and they need to be like redirected saying, no, don't focus on anything else. Focus on this. Right. Uh, yeah. and, and I think that's good. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So with that, let's go ahead and take a look at the text. We are in Hebrews chapter five, beginning at verse 11 today. About this, we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the, in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. That's where we will stop for today. That's our text, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11 through chapter 6, verse 3. All right, so Pastor Dandy, again, our text starts, about this we have much to say. It's hard to explain. We're bridging from the previous section now into a new one. What's what's he doing here? Okay. Yeah, so he, he right now what he's doing is he's basically saying, hey, uh, and, and, and he actually I, that first verse I kind of retranslated where he says, there's much to say about this, right? This this whole doctrine of Jesus being the high priest according to Melchizedek, right? Um, and it's a difficult explanation because you've become lazy hearers, right? Mm. And so he says he's going to unpack this doctrine of Christ, but they need to listen this time because there's so much to unpack about this. And as, you know, I, actually last time we were on this, I was on with you, we were talking about uh, the beginning of the book of Ecclesiastes where we said, there's nothing new under the sun. Um, you know, it's this, this idea that uh, um, you have to be taught something over and over again, um, uh, especially when it comes to things within the church. And so the, the audience of the book of Hebrews has had trouble moving on from the basic doctrines of the faith into maturity of faith, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, you, you you think maybe about, um, okay, so they'll say, Jesus is Messiah, praise God, he died and he rose, right? Um, uh, what a wonderful thing. Now you have to unpack, okay, well, what does the death of Jesus mean? What does the ascension of Jesus mean? What does the resurrection of Jesus mean? What's Jesus doing right now? Um, uh, and, and this is what the author of the Hebrews is really trying to lay out. Like, this is Jesus's activity for you right now. He's your high priest, right? Um, and, and, and that's a big deal um, in terms of how you live as the church, how you live as an individual, um, uh, what, you, what you put your faith in on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, how you receive comfort, um, how you receive assurance that the death and resurrection of Jesus are actually things that are carried out for your good, right? Uh, and so what he's saying is, okay, 
you 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 have confessed that Jesus is the Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah. You understand and believe the account that he has risen again and ascended into heaven. Now, um, let's let's continue to move forward with this doctrine um, so that you can stand firm in this faith that you have of the Son of God. Um, and and that's kind of the, the, the life that we all have as Christians, right? That, that's the thing that we're always kind of, you know, when you and I were pastors, we kind of we kind of live as shepherds of the church. We're teachers in the church. Um, you know, that's one of the things that we're kind of always trying to help people move forward with, right? Um, we, we, start, we start them young, right? We, we teach the young ones the Bible stories. We teach the young ones the catechisms. We talk to the young ones about Jesus, right? But, but we, we don't want to stop there. Right, we don't want to just say okay, uh, and and this is this this is kind of maybe one of the big struggles that we have coming out of twentieth century Lutheranism, right? Where people thought I went to confirmation and was confirmed at the end of eighth grade, I'm done learning now. All the stuff there is to know about Jesus and the life of the church and Christian doctrine, I've been handed. I've been taught all things, right? Um, uh, and, and so they don't think after they're confirmed, I need to go to Bible class, or I actually need to read my Bible, or I actually have to engage in some form of Christian discipleship in the body of Christ under a pastor, right? Um, and, and, you know, you've kind of got the, the, the Hebrews dealing with the same thing here, um, as the, you know, and, and the Hebrews probably that, and we'll get into this a little bit more later in the text here. But it's kind of like the story of the tortoise and the hare a little bit, right? Because uh, as opposed to the Gentile Christians, the Hebrews really have a leg up on them because they, they have the law of Moses, they have the Psalms, they have the prophets, they have the history, right? And they have all the symbols that are leading into Jesus being the Messiah because they've lived in them for so long. And a lot of times what happens is, is that when you have something that becomes so familiar, and that's something that you live in so much that you think, well, since I already know more than those guys, right, uh, the new ones, I don't really need to learn much more because, you know, we, we human beings, we love to compare ourselves to others and we like to measure ourselves according to what other people are doing rather than, you know, uh, what could be done or what we should be doing or what's the best thing we should do, right? Um, and so... Um, we have the Hebrews saying, oh, these Gentiles, they don't even know about King David. So, you know, I'm doing pretty good. And then they kind of rest on those laurels, right? Um, uh, they kind of, they, they sit with that. Um, and, and what that's produced is um, this laziness in hearing, right? Um, as we, as we kind of look at the text here, uh, I forget what the ESV said here. Uh, um, yeah, the ESV said, it's hard to be saying because you're dull of hearing. Um, that you've become dull of hearing uh, really that's kind of almost too nice um it's it's really that you've become slothful um in hearing you've become sluggish uh it, it really and if you want to push it to its its most extreme you've become stupid hearers right because you're not you're not moving beyond what you've heard the first time um, and, and if something moves beyond that, you tune it out because you don't think it's important, right? And, and, you know, that happens with all of us. That's kind of a common temptation that afflicts human beings is that as soon as we move beyond that comfortable, basic uh, uh, level of knowledge, you know, we say, oh, this is too much. This is for the experts. I don't really want to deal with this, right? Um, and so uh, now the writer of the Hebrew is saying, this isn't a good thing. Uh, and then we get into verse 12 where it says, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk and not solid food, right? Uh, and so, you know, in, in a lot of respects, he said, you guys should be teaching this stuff, uh, but because you've been sluggish or slothful in your hearing of the word, um, I need to regard you as babies um, and just take you back to the basics again uh, when, when really this, you, you've heard this all before, right? You've been instructed in this before. You should just assume that I should be living under the assumption I told you this already, 
but now I have to do it all over again. You got to go back to the, and it's, you know, you have the rudimentary principles or the basic entry level principles. I have to review this with you. And why? Well, because you need to hear it. Right. Uh, you know, well, any thoughts on that? Well, I would talk a little bit more about this thought that they're dull of hearing or sluggish of hearing, because I think that's that's something that that still plagues us in, in a number mm-hmm. of ways, and not only when we just don't listen. You know, perhaps we, we just become sloth and we won't listen at all. But I think perhaps more often for, for us as Christians, the, the plague of dull of hearing or sluggishness of hearing is that we're passive in hearing. Mm-hmm. Now, on the, on the one hand, hearing is a passive event. Someone speaks to you, you listen. But I think we forget the active nature of listening as well, that, that there's an engagement that we need as hearers, and sometimes we sit there and just hear only in a passive way without that active sense. So talk a little bit more about, about that, that part of our, yeah. our role yeah. as hearers and the active nature of it. Well, yeah, it, it, it's this idea that, you know, the pastor's just not up there um, giving a—when when the pastor preaches a sermon or teaches a Bible study, he's not up there to give— you um, uh, a lecture on some sort of academic principle that you need to carry out. I actually had to kind of disabuse my confirmands the other day of this idea that we go to church just to, you know, um, uh, I asked I asked them, hey, why do we go to church or why do we listen to sermons, right? Uh, and they said, I guess to, uh, you know, I guess I go there to learn something. It's like, well, you can learn about God in, in a lot of ways. You don't need to actually hear your pastor preach. But what you do need is that you need to hear your Savior speak to you, right? You need the application of the truth to you as an individual. It's not just sheerly this pure academic exercise. And I think sometimes uh, when we forget that, okay, this sermon is for me. This Bible class is for me. This is God's word for me as an individual under God's care. Um, and this is God demonstrating his love for me and speaking this truth to me that we, we get maybe a little listless, right? Um, it, it becomes, it can become almost a monotony, um, or, or, um, it can become boring. Uh, that, that, that's kind of the great big sin of it all. Like, um, uh, uh, uh what is it called? Acadea or Acadea, or I don't forget, I forget how people actually pronounce it, but. Um, it's this this theological or or um, spiritual apathy, where where we all of a sudden start to regard all of these things as being purely unimportant um, informational things, right? Um, where where kind of you know it's it's the same thing. You're you're studying for a history exam and you find out okay the Civil War started in 1861 or whatever, uh, and you say oh that's that's kind of trivial. I can I can actually. Uh, dump that from my brain at some point because it's not information that that's applicable or I'm going to use right. Um, when when in reality this is this isn't just like information that you're being taught. This is this is the truth of the universe in which God has God has achieved in sending His Son to save the world. This is the ultimate saving reality that is applied to you, and so. Um, uh, if it's it's if it's applied to you, if it's the thing that's saving your life, it's it should be interesting, right? It should be something that you you say, I'm going to be actively listening to as much of this as I can, because this is what saves me. It's a, it's a it's you know uh, if, maybe just even thinking about it this way: if you have health problems and the doctor says, hey, uh, do this, 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 and this religiously every day. And you'll live, right? You won't die and succumb to your health problems. Well, guess what? You're going to get to know every bit of every step of what the doctor says because it's what saves you, right? And it's all of a sudden that those kind of, you know, medical jargon terms, right? Um, you know, that you, know, you hear doctors talk about stuff and it's just like they're, they're speaking Latin and they're talking about like medical terms that you can't like even think about depicting in your own imagination because they're so foreign to you all of a sudden those terms become very important and that language uh becomes uh uh uh, uh, an urgent language right um that okay um uh i i have to learn something about this because it's good now when we think about that in terms of our our spiritual development 
um, there's not really a whole lot of room or our discipleship maybe is maybe the better term. There's not a whole lot of room for, for listlessness because we need to hear it. But that's the, the devil's big trick here as we live as the people of God um, is to convince us that what we're getting from the scriptures or what we're learning in confirmation class or what pastors teaching in Bible study or what the devotion book has to say, well, it's of trivial nature. Um, it's something that I can hear today and forget tomorrow uh, because, you know, it's not that urgent, right? Um, it's not a life or death thing. Uh, and, and that's that's the that's the wicked tactic that we we kind of have to deal with as the people of God. Um, our, our sinful flesh doesn't want us to like absorb the scriptures and hear them and believe in them and live under them. Uh, the devil wants us to be distracted. The world's going to tell us everything else is much more important. I, you know, uh, I'm going to get a lot more important stuff, you know, listening to this podcast or watching Fox News or something silly like that. When, when really, you know, the thing that's saving you is right here. So listen. Now. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, when it comes to, for example, the, the sermon in particular, that's where the temptation to be sluggish in hearing is perhaps the most dangerous because the sermon is your pastor speaking to you for, say, 15 to 20 minutes, and you don't have the same opportunity to interact with him in real time. And mm -hmm. so I, I think that's where this danger of sluggishness of hearing can become all the greater, just because you think, oh, I'm just going to sit here for 20 minutes and, and listen, when in reality there is that opportunity to reflect, to interact with him, perhaps not verbally necessarily, sometimes visually, and perhaps, you know, your your posture, your eye contact, or things like that, but even like in note-taking or considering what he's saying to the point that you, you know, like have something you want to ask him about later or, or yeah. something to, to take home and, and think about so that the, the sermon becomes more than just a, you know, a 20-minute part of the worship service, but actually something that influences the rest of your life. That's the kind of active listening that I think the the author of Hebrews would push us toward. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's you know, it and it's it's really just keeping in the spirit of the of the third commandment, right? Um, it's to uh, it, it's not to despise preaching in the word, but to gladly hear and learn it, right? Um, uh, to to gladly receive the instruction that God's servant has been put in this place today to give you because it's a blessing, right? It's good for you. Um, and, and, it's, it, and it's really, and when you think about it in terms of the sermon and your pastor, right? You know, pastors don't, you know, and, and maybe, maybe some pastors have done this in the past and it, it, and it um, has soured people's idea of what preaching is. Pastors don't write their sermons in a vacuum though right? They're, they're not like writing a theological treatise just to sound impressive. Pastors write their sermons on a Sunday to Sunday basis so that you can hear it, right? Um, uh, and especially if you're in a smaller congregation, you know, or a bigger congregation, but, uh, you know, he's your pastor, which means to some extent he knows you. He, he sees what's going on in your life and he cares enough to say something about it. Right. Um, and, and he sees your distress. He sees your temptation. He sees your uh, sorrow. And, and what's he doing? Well, he's seeking to address it to you and the people around you as the body of believers in that place. And so it's worthy of your attention because, I, I mean, this is your pastor, right? <laughs> uh, it's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, well, and, and that's even with, you know, he is your pastor, and so he does know you and is seeking to speak to the, the challenges that he knows you're facing. At the same time, he doesn't know every single aspect of your life. And mm -hmm. so for, for you as a hearer, then, to take what he is saying, and, you know, maybe he didn't mention the example that specifically hits home and what you faced the last six days, but to think through your life with the words that he's speaking, say, okay, I think that applies to me here, even though he didn't say it specifically in that way. Like that's the kind of active hearing that I think we we all can do a better job of. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes you you can use the specific example of 
a, that that a specific person is going through and they still won't apply it to themselves <laughs> it's kind of the frustration of ministry sometimes uh sure. but yeah yeah well it's it's the it's the 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 sluggishness of hearing that we we uh, all suffer through i think sometimes but uh yeah yeah, that's yeah right. you're exactly right yeah, no, we and and this is something again that we we all would do well to watch out for this sluggishness, this laziness of hearing, thinking that we've heard it before, we don't need to pay that close attention, and, and the writer of Hebrews just won't have any of that for us. He calls us to hear the word of God in childlike faith, not in childishness. And I think we'll we'll pick up more of that thought on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on KFUO. We're talking to Pastor Jacob Dandy this morning about Hebrews 5 and 6. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Who does Lutheran Church Extension Fund serve, you ask? It's simple. We serve Lutheran Church Missouri Synod ministries and church workers with loans and ministry services. And it's faithful Lutherans like you, church members and church workers alike, investing with LCEF that makes it possible for LCEF to serve these ministries. Learn more at lcef.org. LCF is a nonprofit religious organization. Therefore, LCF investments are not FDIC insured bank deposit accounts. This is not an offer to sell investments or solicitation to buy. LCF will offer and sell its securities only in states where authorized. The offer is made solely by LCF's offering circular. Investors should carefully read the offering circular, which more fully describes associated risks. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Friday, October 13th. We're studying Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11 through chapter 6, verse 3 with Pastor Jacob Dandy. He serves at Zion Lutheran Church and School in Terrabella, California. Pastor Dandy, prior to the break, we were talking about the hardness of hearing, the dullness of hearing by this congregation to which the author is speaking and preaching. And within this section, he talks about their need for milk rather than solid food. The way that I've talked about this is childishness versus childlike faith. Uh, help us into this distinction between milk and solid food, what he's, what he's calling them toward here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what he's saying is, you know, what do you give a baby? What can a baby palate? What's, what's palatable and digestible for a, a newborn? Well, it's milk, right? Um, what's most nutritionally beneficial for a newborn? It's milk. And so, you know, of course, that's what you give to the baby. Uh, but also, as you, you have a child uh, and you feed them milk, uh, you don't feed them milk with the expectation that they're going to be doing that for the next 60 years, right? Uh, having this diet exclusively of, of milk intended for children, right? Um, and, and, you know, I think, uh, you know, we really have to make this distinction. You know, Jesus says that, um, you know, uh, we're supposed to uh, receive him and believe in him such as a little child, right? Um, and that we're supposed to have a childlike faith. And, 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 you know, so we think about what, maybe what that means, right? Having a childlike faith, you know, means we, we suspend our disbelief. We, we trust in Christ's care for us. We live as infants in the care of their parents uh, to a certain this regard that, um, we're completely dependent upon Jesus. We trust in what Jesus has to say to us. Um, we know that Jesus acts for our good and loves us, and that that um, what what Jesus speaks, what Jesus does, how Jesus acts, is done for our care, right? Um, and so that's the same thing that little children do with their parents, right? Um, you know, so maybe the suspending disbelief. Um, lately, I have a two-year-old. Um, and he has uh, um, kind of imprinted, uh, we have a Kermit the Frog doll, and I'll hold up the Kermit the Frog doll and try to do my best Kermit the Frog voice and talk to him, right? And, and what does he do? He suspends his disbelief um, and trust that Kermit the Frog is talking to him, right? It's no longer Daddy who's speaking, it's Kermit, right? Now, 
And to a certain degree, that's very appropriate for a two-year-old. Now, on the same note, if I walked up to you, Tim, and started talking to you with a doll and a Kermit the Frog voice, that's no longer, no longer a good option. That's no longer the appropriate way to communicate uh, with an adult, right? And, and, and that's really the same thing that the, the author of Hebrews is saying here, is that, you know, we're, we're not to, to remain in childish ignorance and vulnerability, um, but that we, we are to, to grow in our understanding of the world around us. We're to grow in the understanding of the word that Christ teaches us right now. So, for example, my, my four-year-old can point to the painting of Jesus and say, Jesus loves me, Jesus died for me, um, uh, and, and Jesus forgives all of my sins and he's taking me to heaven, right? A four-year-old can do that, and that's wonderful, right? That's like the greatest thing I can hear from the mouth of my four-year-old, right? Uh, it's actually the greatest thing I can hear from the mouth of anyone. But then also, that understanding that she has is going to expand. It's going to grow. She's going to think about different ways that Jesus demonstrates care for her. Um, she's going to to grow in her understanding of the maybe the sacramental nature of Jesus's care for her as she grows up. She's going to experience more hardship where that care for Jesus is going to, that care that Jesus has for her is going to be more precious the older she gets, right? Um, and, and these things naturally happen, right? Um, and, and so she's, gonna, she's going to, to, to grow on that foundation and build in her understanding, right? And that's, that's kind of what the author of the Hebrews is getting at, um, is that, that, you know, the, the expectation is that the newborn is going to stop drinking milk at some point, be weaned and eat solid food. Um, and that's maybe the same expectation that we should have um, for our, our own Christian discipleship is, and, and, and you know, this is not me saying that the basics are not important or that the basics are to be despised, um, but that we are to grow in our understanding of the basics. And what that does is that actually makes them more beautiful. That makes them more precious. That makes them um, uh, more comforting and more convicting as we, we grow. Uh, you know, we, what, a Lutheran pastor will never move away from teaching the catechism. But, man, your understanding of the catechism and, and, and the, how, how, how those, those basic chief parts of the faith blossom to to overlap into every area of your life i mean that that is something that comes with time that's something that comes with prolonged instruction that's something that comes with experience and study right uh, and and those things those things matter uh we we shouldn't just be satisfied okay the guy confirmed to me 20 years ago i'm done right that's that's not how it works right i I actually gonna like I'm never gonna graduate from learning about you know the mysteries of the scriptures and the and the beauty of what Jesus has done and the glorification of the Christ and all of these other things right we these things continue to expand um, as the Holy Spirit teaches us through His Word and sacraments. Yeah, I mean, I think so. On the one hand, there's the the childishness that's being talked about here, that they're just not ready for solid food because they've been slow to hear, they've been dull of hearing. There's also a, a childishness that can show itself in thinking that you can move beyond the basics to something higher or better that isn't built upon the basics. You know, yeah. kind of the way like Luther talks about it, it's in the it's in the large catechism, right? The preface where he talks about, you know, he goes back every day to the basics of the catechism. And as you do that, you are building and you are receiving solid food that's founded in that milk and not something higher than or different from that, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, and, and as a pastor too, you know, I teach confirmation every year. I teach the kids through the catechism every year. And, and, and really the beautiful thing about it is that every year as I kind of have to reconsider everything I teach and I have to review and restudy 
um, all, all the kind of contents of the small catechism that I'm teaching to the children in the school here and I teach to my confirmands and all of that stuff. How like every once in a while, you'll just have this big aha moment, right? Right. Where, where, where the, 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 the little concept that, that you learned is this kind of maybe, you know, one line bit of truth when you were a kid, all of a sudden just blossoms and explodes where you say, oh, this really has an effect on everything. You know, um, I remember that really early in my ministry, just thinking about the fourth commandment and, and how that led to my understanding of the three estates and um, how that makes you think about, you know, the, the functioning of government and the functioning of a home and, and the life of the church and how all of these things kind of come together and it just grows and grows and grows. Uh, and, and then you also then look at that with uh, just when you're, you're considering the, uh, um, uh, the two natures of Christ and um, the, the, the nature of the communication of the divine attributes to the human attributes. And, you know, and you get that stuff in seminary a lot, but then, you know, you think about how that then, oh, well, hey, that applies a lot to the sacraments, right? Uh, that applies a lot to the Lord's Supper that, you know, um, um, that, uh, and, and then you start to think, well, that applies a little bit to how we're saved, that we become heirs of Christ. And, and, you know, these things kind of once again, expand, um, and, and make, um, the study of God's word more and more beautiful, but it, it's, it's not built on anything other than, than the elementary basic principles. They just become bigger. They become beautiful. It's kind of like, um, um, this just came to mind, Aslan, you guys, you remember Aslan, right? From C.S. Lewis, the Chronicles of Narnia, um, where in the, the second book, Prince Caspian, uh, the Pevensey kids go into Narnia for their second time. And Lucy sees Aslan and she says, Aslan, you're much bigger. Uh, and Aslan says, I'm not bigger. You've grown and I seem bigger, right? I, um, and what does that mean? They said, she, as she's matured, um, uh, Aslan has grown uh, in her perspective, really. Um, as she's matured, you know, the concepts, the truths, the, the mercy, the, the glory, the grandeur, has grown. And, and that's the same thing that we have as we live before God. Um, the grace of Christ gets bigger. The importance of the resurrection gets bigger. Um, it yeah. blossoms, it grows, it gets more beautiful. Right. And so in that way, you do remain a child of God. You don't somehow become a, a grown-up or an independent. of You know what I mean? Like, we're, we're yeah. always children of God, but you continue to grow in that childlike faith yeah. all the more as you as you progress to the solid food. I think and that's one of the, the struggles here is that you know, on the one hand, yes, you have to keep you have to keep with the basics. You have to know the catechism, but the more that you dig into them, the more that you mature. And at the same time, that just makes you even more of a a, re, a child of God, yeah. dependent, trusting upon him. Yeah. Yeah, you know, the one who's feeding you is still God. Right. Um, yeah, he's the one who's still opening up his hand and offering himself to you. And, and that's that's the thing that we remember. Right. Um, we're we're just as you know, you, you you have like the brilliant minds of the guys teaching theology in the universities and the seminaries and all of this other stuff. Right. Um, they're they're just as much dependent on the grace of Christ as, you know, the freshly baptized a uh, newborn little child is. And that's, that's the thing that we remember. It's just that, that they've grown and they've studied and they've matured, but in that maturity, they still have the same amount of care from God. Yeah. Yeah. Now you've, in, in the notes that you sent me ahead of time, you, you made this note about slogans and how uh, perhaps if, if we're constantly just p depending on slogans when it comes to our theology, maybe that's a, a sign that we're caught in this childishness that the Hebrews seem to be. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, a slogan, a theological, so there's like, you know, you, you have people saying, hey, well, you got to let go and let God or, um, you know, uh, God is good all the time. Or even, even us in the, in the Lutheran tradition, we have the five solas of the Reformation. Um, and, and these are, these are fine to a certain extent, right? But if, if we reduce all of our theology down to like these little Christian catchphrases, um, what happens is that, you know, 
first of all, slogans are often intentionally memorable. They're intentionally short. Um, and they're also, you know, to a certain respect, intentionally simple and vague. Right. Um, and so th there's, there's this thing that, you know, a certain point you have to look beyond the slogan and, and grow in your understanding of the truth that be goes beyond it because there's, there's, there's more to being a Christian than saying, let go and let God, or, or, um, there's more than, uh, you know, there, there's a lot to explore, for example, and the, uh, idea and the topic of sola scriptura or sola fide, right? Um, there's a lot to be said about that because, you know, you can get two kind of really, um, opposing theological traditions that grow, um, and still both can confess, oh yeah, we believe in sola fide, right? And so what's going on there? Uh, and so there's so much more to the Christian faith than the solas and the slogans. And so the, the milk is kind of maybe the short little slogans, but the solid food is that's the continual and steady hearing and learning of the word of God. You know, um, uh, slogans are maybe for infancy. Uh, solid food is what sustains you for a lifetime. A Christian's faith will starve if it lives simply on little theological slogans. Because they're, uh, eventually they're going to they're gonna misapply that slogan or they're going to misunderstand it. And then all of a sudden it's going to crumble around them. And, um, and actually that's, that's really the, the other half of the context of this text that we're looking at. Because um, what, what, is, what is the writer of Hebrews leading to? Uh, well, he's, he's reading to a warning against apostasy. He's trying to say, hey... You need to be diligent in learning the faith because it's going to be attacked and you might lose it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's the kind of continual danger that we live under because, I, you know, um, the, we, we, we talk about putting on the armor of God, right? Well, well that's, that's why we have the, 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 the sword of the spirit and, you know, the um, the, the blessing of God's word that, that, that these things are going to equip the saints to endure the attacks against your faith. Right. And, and a lot of times it's, it's the, the poorly catechized who are the easiestly ones who are easily tricked, easily fooled into, to wandering from the faith. And so, um, this, this continual um, growth or, or this lack of complacency in hearing, you know, we don't want to fall victim to spiritual listlessness as we live as the people of God, but we want to be continual recipients of God's word so that we grow in our faith and our understanding and our conviction uh, of what God gives us as we live in the faith. Yeah. I mean, you know, the warning against apostasy, as you said, is, is where we're headed. And I, I think of the the parable of the sower that Jesus tells and the, the seed that sprouts, but it has no root and it is quickly scorched. You know, the, the importance of having of roots, of letting those those roots grow, and they grow by the continual sowing of the word of God. And so if if all you have are the slogans, you know, you're just reading the tweets and not the full not the full scriptures, then then how are the roots going to develop? And that's what the, the author wants for his hearers. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's a big struggle. Um it, it's probably even more of a struggle now than it was then just because we're so driven by uh, by the tweets right um you know how 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 is a uh, how do a lot of uh christian uh parishioners receive their theology nowadays it's through memes right <laughs> about to say that you know uh, a dang mean isn't a meme isn't a, a a good thing here and there but man you you gotta look past the meme right you gotta actually open the book read the bible uh yeah so that's uh, right. Hear That's the right. pastor preach. By That's all means, right. go to Bible class, you people. Yes. <laughs> listen, yes. listen. You, uh, yeah. If you're if if you're listening today, all of you listening and tuning into KFUO, your pastor is teaching a Bible class sometime this week. Go. It'll be so good for you. <laughs> 
Neat. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Now, as the, the author continues into to where we mark chapter 6, the beginning, he says, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity. And then he, he lists a bunch of, of the doctrines that he's talking about. What's, what's he doing here in these first three verses of chapter 6? Well, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's looking at these things that they have been instructed in, right? And so um, uh, the foundation of repentance, uh, dead works, uh, or uh, of repentance from dead works to the faith toward God, the instructions about washing and laying on hands, the resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment, right? You know, and, and what are these? Um, these are the foundational blocks of, of the Christian faith. You know, what do we have? Well, we have repentance, we have faith, we have baptism, we've got um, uh, ministry and, of reconciliation, and, and the, uh, the office of the ministry and all of these things, the resurrection and, and the last things, right? Uh, and, and these are, you know, what you would teach any early Christian, right? Um, these are the, the basic things, right? Um, Jesus has come to die for you. Repent of your sins, believe in the gospel. Be baptized, right? What you know? What's what's the content of Peter's first sermon? It you know, wh where does it lead to? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the promised Holy Spirit. Um, and this promise is is for you and your children and those who are far off, so on and so forth, right? Um, it's basically you know, this is this is what Peter gives at the very first at the beginning where he calls all of these Jews in Jerusalem for the festival of Pentecost uh, to hear, right? Uh, that that this Jesus who you killed has risen from the dead, but he's done it to forgive you of your sins. Now believe in this and and trust in Jesus, right? And so that's the basics. Well, he's not saying, ditch the basics, move on from them so you can learn something better than the basics. He's saying, okay, uh, and, and this is the important part. He says, we go on maturity, not laying again a foundation, right? You don't build, lay foundation upon foundation upon foundation. What do you do after you've laid the foundation? Well, you build the structure upon it, right? Um, you're, you're building a cathedral, right? And so now we've laid the foundation for the cathedral, and this is integral and it's important. Now let's build the cathedral. Let's put in the beautiful stonework. Let's master the craft of stained glass. Let's look at the masonry. Let's put in the statues. Let's lay the foundations and the bases of the altar. Let's uh, erect a pulpit. Let's let's put in the 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 towers and the parapets and the bells and all of these things. Let's grow up from these basic things that you have been given um, because um, it, it will grow to be something more and more beautiful. Um, uh, that this will grow into being this, 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 this gorgeous cathedral that you stand in awe of every day and will never stop being built. It'll never stop rising up from this foundation until the very last day where you stand before Jesus and you see this, this complete image of the thing that you only had little glimpses of, right? Um, and so grow in that so that your, A, that your faith is fortified, that you're strengthened, um, that you have this refuge um, from the attacks of the evil one, but then also that, that you live in the joy of, of this beautiful thing that God has laid before you. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. The, the image of the building as you were using it, I think is very helpful. And again, we've got that here. Maybe another, another image is, is putting together a, a puzzle. So yeah. after you've, you know, at least the way that I've put together puzzles, generally I put together the edges first, and then you work from there into the, the inside. After you've put the edges together, when you start putting together the middle, you, every time you have to look at the rest of the puzzle so that it all fits together. Yeah. So it's not like you you start contradicting the rest of the doctrine or you start you know you start leaving it behind or something. You you look at that and then you say, "Okay, now where does this lead next? How do how do I keep growing in what's already there?" Maybe that's another way to yeah. to put an image to it. Yeah, you're not going to reach into another box and grab pieces from a different puzzle and start trying to jam them in there, right? Yeah. Right. Um you're you're going <laughs> to If you do, you'll quickly see that doesn't work. Yeah. yeah. It's 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 going to it's going to make an ugly picture at the end, I think. Uh, no, what you're going to do is you're going to, you're going to fill in the, fill in what you have, right? Um, 
Uh, and, and, you know, maybe St. Paul, he puts it this way. He, he, he talks about, and was it first Corinthians 13 right now we see through the looking glass dim or see through the mirror dimly or look into the mirror dimly. Uh, and then we'll see in fullness. Right. Um, and so maybe it's just this, it's becomes clearer and clearer. Um, uh, and, and the beauty of it becomes more and more apparent and it matures and it, and it grows with you and it, um, and, you know, it's, it's maybe even you think about it this way it's it's like moving from the first year of marriage to the 20th year of marriage um how that relationship has matured and grown and grown stronger and actually gotten more beautiful and your love for your spouse um uh deepens the longer that you're married to them uh and that you because you've endured more and you've suffered through more and you care more Right. Um, and you understand each other better. Uh, and, and, and so maybe that's another image too, is that you, you look at these things, you know, we're not going to like hop off of the foundation and then start building somewhere else. Right. We're going to, we're going to continue to look at the thing that we have and just grow up from it. Right. And, and that's, yeah. that's the beautiful part of it. That's the, the beautiful bit. It, Absolutely. It, it's, it's actually Absolutely. one of the things that just makes life in the church of God, such a joyful mystery, <laughs> you know, because you're always, uh, you're always kind of discovering something wonderful in the scriptures. Uh, you're discovering something wonderful about what God has done for you and, and what care God has made in forming this world around you. It's so great. That's right. That's right. And this we will do if God permits. Uh, yeah. Yeah. As, as our yeah. section concludes. Yeah. So, <laughs> That's, so yeah, I love Pastor that. Danny, We've got about three minutes here. Uh, yeah. yeah. So so if we've got enough time in the sermon, if the Lord grants us uh, however much time he grants us, we will continue to do this together as congregation and people. Maybe it's the way we should should understand that. With yeah. about three minutes, Pastor Danny, help us to to wrap this text up. Give us the, the good news, the encouragement uh, from this section of Hebrews. Well, yeah. So there's, there's maybe the, the law bit is that, hey, don't be dull in hearing. Don't be stupid listeners, right? Um, uh, you know, uh, saying that to the people listening on the radio right now, uh, 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 no insult to you, but um, don't, don't grow lazy as you hear the word of God. Um, don't grow complacent. Don't treat what is being preached and taught from the Holy Scriptures, what is being preached and taught to you as it's a, like a triviality because y- you know enough because you don't. Right, none of us do. Where we all have something to learn from the hand of God. We all have something to learn from the sacred scriptures. Uh, we have something to learn about what Jesus does for us, or how Jesus treats us, and how Jesus cares for us. Um, and so, uh, don't grow complacent in your listening. Don't grow listless in your faith. Uh, but then the the encouragement is is that hey, there there is there is more to learn. There, there is more to, to the basics. Your faith is not a boring faith, but it's a beautiful faith that, that grows, it blossoms, it, it matures. Um, and, and when it does that, God is actually equipping you to endure in the faith um, through uh, many toils and tribulations and pains and sufferings and temptations. Um, and, and all the troubles of this world, God is being merciful and gracious and continually just kind of peeling back the layers so that, that you see him more and more clearly, building on the foundation so that you see this beautiful thing grow in front of you, that you may know him and that he, you may be his own and live under him in his kingdom. Uh, and so uh, uh, there's, there's lots of encouragement and there's lots of joy in this text. Um, as we're invited to to grow in our knowledge of Christ and what he does for us. Pastor Jacob Dandy is pastor at Zion Lutheran Church and School in Terrabella, California. He's been helping us today to study Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11 through chapter 6, verse 3. Pastor Dandy, thanks for being our guest today. No, it's been a good pleasure. Thank you. I am your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. If any questions about the book of Hebrews, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. It is always a pleasure to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk again next week.